wait uh, yeah, three minutes and we start this lecture at 12.05 until then the, the others can join. Yeah, you see, so it's, it's worth waiting a little bit because people are joining gradually to this meeting. And uh, as you probably saw that uh, there's a recording, so uh, there will be an available uh, video record of this talk. Probably uh, you can get access via the, the YouTube channel of our department. So after we, we get it, uh, you can spread it among your students or any community, it usually works well. Mm -hmm. Okay, two more minutes. One. You can already try to share. Yeah, yeah, you can uh, check your sharing. Ah, yeah, okay. okay. It's completely working. Let's see everything. Yeah, I think I start the introduction because I, I don't want to be uh, very lengthy, but I would like to say a few things about you. So uh, welcome everyone. And I would like you to introduce Professor Eva Ringler, who is now uh, head of the Division of Behavioral Ecology at the University of Bern in, in Switzerland. But she graduated in Vienna and she works mainly with poison frogs, but uh, many other other species as well. And actually, I was quite surprised at first that uh, there are uh, quite a lot of good researchers in small landlocked uh, Central European countries uh, like Austria and, and Switzerland uh, about poison frogs. Uh, and Probably you all know that uh, poison frogs are uh, famous about their poisonous skin and their aposematic coloration, but they are also a very unique uh, group of frogs because uh, their activity is mostly uh, diurnal and they have a very fast metabolism, uh, complex and diverse social life, including territorial behavior, uh, well-developed locomotion and orientation abilities, uh, terrestrial egg laying, and after that, a very complex parental care involving uh, transportation of tadpoles, sometimes feeding of the tadpoles. But this behavior is also uh, somewhat flexible and diverse, and uh, I, I guess that we will hear something about it. So the approach that uh, Eva uses is mostly field and laboratory experiments, like the classic methodology of behavioral and uh, evolutionary biology, of which uh, many of you in the audience are familiar with working on birds or insects. And uh, probably you are interested how these methods can be applied to frogs. And I'm also really interested in it because uh, these well-organized and, and well-planned uh, behavioral research is very essential for doing comparative work as well. So I'm very happy that uh, Eva uh, accepted our invitation. So now you can start your talk. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Balash, very for this uh, super nice introduction. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eva Ringel, as Gert Balash already in indicated. I'm right now at the University of Bern, starting a new group since two and a half years. And I want to give you a little bit of, a, of an overview why I'm so excited about, um, yeah, reproductive behavior, especially in frogs. And, and uh, yeah, I don't know how many of you are very familiar about uh, with um, reproductive strategies in frogs, but in the general public, but also in uh, a lot of colleagues, uh, the, the, uh, the common conception about how amphibians reproduce is that Males and females come at particular times of the year to big water bodies, release thousands of eggs, and then disappear again in the habitat. But um, I want to highlight um, that uh, this is might be true for some 
amphibian um, taxa, but definitely uh, completely misses the point because amphibian um, reproduction is incredibly di diverse. And this already starts uh, when you look at different mating positions that amphibians can uh, take in order to mate and release the eggs. And also another common misconception is that amphibians really love water and they really try to see, seek every possibility to uh, live and reproduce in aquatic environments. But if we look at the diversity of amphibian reproductive behaviors, we actually see the exact opposite. So it seems that amphibians try almost everything to get either their eggs or at least their tadpoles somehow independent from large water bodies. And this was yeah, many years uh, uh, beforehand illustrated by my previous PhD supervisor, Walter Hödel, who try to describe the diversity of um, rainforest frogs in the Amazon. And he found that, of course, there is this very, very basic reproductive mode of just releasing eggs in the water and then disappearing. But there are also so many other strategies that uh, amphibians in general exhibit to get their eggs somehow out of the water. And it has been discussed that this is probably due to a very high predation pressure on the eggs in aquatic environments. So what we see, what amphibians do is they submerge the eggs or even the frog legs into certain structures in their skin or yeah, other parts in the body. They create foam nests that allows them to place the eggs a little bit outside of water bodies, but still um, make sure that uh, they, they are not, um, yeah, that the desiccation is not a problem. Then there are other species that deposit their eggs on vegetation or other structures on the land. And in this particular case, these are glass frogs. So they deposit the eggs on vegetation that is overhanging streams or large water bodies. So as soon as the tadpoles hatch, they drop into the water where they can complete their development. And the, there's also uh, yeah, the, the most extreme form of this uh, terrestriality um, in, in the case where the, the amphibians deposit really clutches directly on land, so completely independent from water bodies and uh, also not in direct association with water bodies. So there, uh, the tadpole transport and parental care comes in. So in these cases, the parents need to ensure that the tadpoles at some stage um, get into water via tadpole transport. And this is the predominant form of parenting and also a predominant reproductive strategy in one of the frog families that I got most fascinated with, and these are poison frogs. So I don't know how many of you are very familiar with uh, these frog families, so they comprise more than 300 different species and probably most of you are um, most familiar with the highly aposematic, colorful and toxic species, but poison frogs are actually um, a clade that is consistent of, of two large phylogenetic branches. The one is the true, so-called true poison frogs, the dendrobatine or dendrobatide. So um, people working on systematics in these, uh, in these frogs, they are constantly um, discussing <laughs> and arguing whether this entire um, yeah, clade should be called a family or actually two different frog families because yeah, we, we find these uh, two different branches of these aposematic so-called true poison frogs and the rather more cryptic species, the so-called aromobatine or aromobatide, depending on which taxonomic level you want to put them. I personally like to call the entire clade poison frogs because I want to highlight what unites them. And this is their behavioral ecology and their yeah, social structure, so to say. So all poison frogs have one thing in common, and this is that they deposit their eggs independent of large water bodies. So deposit them in the leaf litter, in trunks, in bromeliads, so really outside 
of water bodies. And this is why in almost all of uh, the poison frogs, there is parental care in terms of tadpole transport involved. So the parent comes, picks up the clutches that are laid, yeah, for example, here in the leaf litter and transports them to water bodies. And within the poison frogs, we also find a huge variation in how this is accomplished. So we have certain species that really pick up entire clutches that contain up to yeah, 20, 30 tadpoles at once and shuttle them all at once to very large reproductive pools that um, contain, of course, a lot of nutrients, so food for these developing tadpoles. So this is the, also the reason why in these cases, very often we don't find any parental care post uh, tadpole deposition. But in these very large water bodies, we also find a large number of predators. And this is why we find an evolutionary transition towards the complete other extreme, which is the transport of, their, of single tadpoles one by one to very small phytothelmata such as bromeliad axils, where basically only rainwater accumulates. This means that there are no predators in these very small water bodies, but on the downside, there is also no food. And this is why in those species that have these very uh, yeah, specific tadpole transports where they really transport tadpoles one by one, we find even social monogamy evolved in some of those species as the male and the female stay in close association where the male show, repeatedly motivates the female to get back to these tadpole deposition sites and release unfertilized eggs to feed those tadpoles. The species that I've dedicated uh, yeah, quite some time in the last uh, few years is called Alobates femoralis. It's a, a, yeah, a, a member of the yeah, non-toxic uh, poison frogs, but it shows the same uh, yeah, reproductive behavior as all poison frogs. So here in this species, the male is very, um, uh, territorial, it announces its territory occupancy via a very prominent advertisement call and tries to attract female mating partners. They sit interdispersed between these male territories and visit males for courtship and mating. And they deposit clutches inside the male's territory and after oviposition, the females go back to their resting site. This also means that the male is uh, responsible for tadpole transport. So they transport these tadpoles to water bodies and afterwards home back to their territory to yeah, resume their uh, advertisement calling and, and, and meeting activities. And in my research group, we are trying to understand how patterns of space use, for example, in these, uh, in these species is linked to ways how males and females and maybe even parents and offspring communicate with each other. What does this mean for cognition? So can they discriminate between different individuals, between different tadpoles? How do they uh, remember certain landmarks to find their way in the rainforest? So, so navigation is a big topic in our uh, group. And uh, recently I started to also integrate animal personality in our research. So I tried to understand uh, to what extent do individual differences in, in behavior, so how individuals interact and reproduce matter for, um, for evolutionary processes, so basically how successful they are in the long run. And we conduct our studies both in the field as well as in the lab. So we have a field site that we visit since 2007, and we created an yeah, artificial frog island. I will talk about this a bit later uh, in 2012, where we investigate yeah, also our frog in a natural setting, but confined setup. And the captive population I installed in 2012. And since uh, yeah, <laughs> the, the past 10 years, uh, the breeding program is, is going really well. And at the moment we have about 300 adult individuals that we use for behavioral experiments. 
And for you to get a better feeling what this type of transport looks like, because this is yeah, one of the core areas of my research, uh, I've assured videos. So this is basically a male before pickup. So you see that he lowers his body and performs some rotation movements so that the tadpoles can easily climb on the, on the back of the male. And as soon as this is completed, and this can take yeah, half an hour to even an hour until all the tadpoles are collected, then he will go off and try to deposit them in suitable pools that are outside of uh, his territory. So these, um, yeah, these water bodies that the frogs use for that tadpole deposition are usually not within the male's territory. Yes, and uh, we try to first assess uh, the yeah, tadpole transport performance in these individuals. And we found that really as, expect, uh, as yeah, expected, most of those tadpole transports were really conducted by males and they were also confirmed as the genetic fathers of those tadpoles. Whereas in about 7.8% of the cases, we found a female with tadpoles on the back running through the rainforest. And we were asking, okay, why is this the case? And a genetic parentogen analysis confirmed that these were really the genetic mothers of those tadpoles. And uh, the fathers from the parentage analysis could either not be identified to any of the males that we sampled in our population or were linked to a male that at least was not uh, alive anymore at the time of tadpole transport. And this let us uh, speculate whether females show something like a compensatory uh, yeah, parental behavior by jumping in when the, the fathers are missing. And we tested this experimentally in the lab by uh, setting up two conditions. So in the control conditions, we basically kept males and females in the same uh, tank. And then we simply monitored who's transporting. And in 0% uh, of the cases, females took over the tadpole transport duty. It was always the males. However, when we removed the males after oviposition, then we were able to elicit 100% of tadpole transport behavior in the females. And this was also happening in almost exactly the time, same time frame that males would have done it. And this was pretty exciting for us because this shows that this, uh, that this is an example for spontaneous compensatory flexibility in actually generally only parental species. So we have quite nice reports from this compensation of parental care in biparental species. So in a lot of birds and fish, it is known that if one partner or one parent deserts or dies, then the other parent can somehow resume the missing parent's role. But in uniparental species, this was so far completely unknown. And uh, this also indicates that maybe these parental roles are much more flexible, especially in poison frogs uh, than we think. And we tried to replicate this experiment also then in the field. So we looked for clutches, removed the territorial males, and then set up video cameras in order to film females coming and picking up the tadpoles for transport, which in most of the, well, yeah, basically it worked. Uh, however, in one of those cases, we made uh, this observation. And this was not a female, but this is a male individual that entered the removed male's territory and started to prey on the clutches. And this was uh, yeah, pretty surprising to us because in the literature, there are only a very few anecdotal reports of clutch cannibalism in poison frogs. And this was mainly in female individuals and only in captive conditions. So in these studies, they basically, or in these reports, they mainly interpreted this as a, yeah, that, that maybe they didn't feed the females enough or that this was some artifact from captive conditions. But this was in the field and femoralis is a very opportunistic feeder. So we could somehow exclude that they were hungry. And therefore we came up with the hypothesis that maybe, uh, they prey on other males' tadpoles if they take over their territory as a 
form of removing genetic material of the previous territory holder. And we also tested this experimentally by removing males to different tanks and thereby simulating a territory takeover event. And we could really elicit cannibalistic behavior in exactly this territory takeover group, but not in the control group that was removed out of their home tank, but then put back again to, in order to have the same handling effects in those both treatment groups. Uh, we also ask ourselves, uh, yeah, in, in most of the cases, of course, uh, males of the fathers transport their own tadpoles. And one uh, key question that we ask ourselves is, where do they bring their tadpoles to? How do they know where the pools are? And what factors do they take into account uh, to make decisions whether to deposit in a, deposit in a certain pool or not? And for that, this, we use the founding phase of this experimental island. So you see here a map, so I can try to have this, this pointer. So this is the, uh, yeah, this is all forest area. This is the study site where we have been working before. So this is more or less the dimensions where a natural Allobates femoralis population occurs in the study area. And this is the river that is surrounding uh, this, um, this field site. And there is a, just a patch of land, which is about five hectares in size, that is more or less sticking out of the water. So there are frogs occurring on this side of the river, there are frogs occurring on the other side of the river, but just not in the middle. And we got um, permits to translocate some of the tadpoles, which we did in 2012, and we also clipped a small piece of the tail from each individual tadpole and noted down in which artificial pool these tadpoles were then released. So they were released on the island in these plastic buckets, so to say, uh, to, that were also predator free. And we hoped that they would survive metamorphose and become adults in the subsequent year. So um, we can, um, so this is what you see here is this, this island setup with, we also established a, a trail uh, grid for that we could easier uh, reach different locations on the island. And these 20 artificial pools were set up in the beginning to facilitate the colonization phase of the island. Then if you wonder how we reach our uh, field site, so this is this is a video basically how our daily work uh, to the field site looks like. So we have a slack line um, established where we have um, a harness and pull ourselves over the river. So in, you can probably imagine that it's very crucial that you think uh, beforehand if you have all the equipment you need uh, already with you. And uh, in order to investigate the position strategies in our frogs, we created uh, in the following year, a setup where we removed every second pool on the island. So the axis here indicates that this pool was removed after in the next uh, breeding season. And this, uh, this we did in order to create adult individuals that had their natal pool still available and the other half of the frogs where their natal pool was removed. And we used microset, uh, microsatellite genotyping more or less to match tadpole and adult genotypes. And since we knew which tadpole genotype was deposited in which artificial water uh, body, we could um, yeah, um, assign each adult individual in uh, to 13 uh, natal pool on the island. So we knew from each adult individual where it originated from. And then we did another round of tadpole sampling in these pools. So always only collecting the, the tip of the tail so that also tadpoles can survive this procedure, of course. And then we performed parentage analysis to reconstruct where on the island did frogs deposit the pools. And uh, we used 
some uh, yeah, um, machine learning algorithms to uh, identify deposition patterns in, on these islands. And we, I, we and these results show that the most important predictor for whether a pool would receive a tadpole was the presence of predatory dragonfly larvae. So these are really the top predators of our uh, frog larvae in the field. And then we see more or less a trade-off between how far do frogs need to travel in order to deposit their tadpoles and whether also their natal pool is uh, still in, in, yeah, in near distance to the current location of the frogs. So I don't want to go too much into detail here, but this very nicely showed that there's really uh, a trade-off between uh, different risks and, and, and benefits of different tadpole deposition strategies. And the project that I have dedicated the last uh, three years of research was to identify how do differences in individual tendencies to um, be aggressive, to be explorative, and also to, yeah, to be shy, bold, influence patterns of mate choice and parental care. And how does all of this matter for reproduction and survival? And this was done uh, um, mainly, so most of the fieldwork and all the analysis were done by my PhD student, Melissa Pinier. So she finished uh, just two months ago and yeah, is now in the job market for, for postdoc. And together also with my collaborators, Yimen uh, and Virginie, we looked at different components of these personality traits and how they affect um, uh, basically the, the, the population as, as, as a whole. And we did a lot of field work identifying behavioral traits in the field, characterizing the environment, uh, doing hormonal essays to have a, yeah, right a, a yeah, pretty global overview uh, of uh, behavioral differences and how they matter in the long run over on a population scale. So Sara Shalupka, a master's student, she identified that territorial aggression in these frogs is highly repeatable. So we test territorial aggression by broadcasting a loudspeaker inside a frog's territory and then measuring the aggressive responses in terms of latency and also speed of attack. And Melissa then characterized also the spatial distribution of these personality types across the island. And another master student, uh, Lorian uh, Biggis, she looked at whether habitat choice is linked to personality types, so whether more explorative individuals are better in settling in a higher quality environment. And what she found that is that uh, the, the ways how we measure exploration were highly consistent across different spatial scales. Uh, so the, yeah, the, the exploration levels that were measured in a very artificial standardized setting like an open field test very much matched the exploration behavior they, um, they showed in a more naturalistic uh, mesocosm setting. We also asked uh, how is personality linked to reproductive success? And this was a bit tricky because personality is uh, a, compos yeah, a composite term of different personality traits, such as aggression, boldness, and exploration. And also reproductive success can be linked to either mating success, offspring production, and also finally offspring survival. And we thought that all these personality traits might impact on these different components of reproductive success very differently. And uh, so Melissa has done a really amazing work in identifying uh, mating and reproductive success and also cross-generational uh, reproductive success um, in this island population. And we found that there are really opposing effects of these personality traits on these different components of reproductive success and also the yeah, which combinations of behaviors are beneficial for different components of reproductive success are very different for males and females. We also looked at uh, exploration and how this matters for uh, parental care. So we asked whether um, frogs that show high exploration scores are also the first 
that discover novel reproductive sites. And for that, we also manipulated the island that we completely removed the, the, the artificial pools that were present in the year before. So in, in this year, we had a, this, this cross setup. So this axis means that these pools, they should have been uh, yeah, familiar or known to the frogs on the island. They were removed completely. And we set up artificial pools in 45 degrees uh, angular deviation so that completely novel locations when no pool was there previously. And uh, we asked, is uh, personality uh, affecting how quickly frogs appear at these sites? Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, PowerPoint just crashed. Okay, hello. Okay, my, my PowerPoint just crashed. Okay. Is it completely frozen? Okay, can, you, can you see the, the slide? No, right? Uh, we, we still see the, the frogonality slide with uh, the map of the island. You want to change it? I just try to yeah, yeah, yeah. try try it again. Okay. Just need to go forward. Come on. Yes. Okay. okay, so I try not to lose the later point anymore. Yes, and uh, yeah, we were um, basically investigating whether personality is basically linked how quickly frogs could find these pools. And from previous work, also from some colleagues, we know that uh, older cues are quite important in these frogs to discover these reproductive sites. We also uh, manipulated whether these novel reproductive uh, or these, these water bodies had uh, older cues that could help them guide uh, to find these, uh, these reproductive resources. And another ongoing project uh, that I'd like to mention is that we also try to under better understand whether there are quite uh, yeah, other aspects of the tadpole transport behavior that uh, affect the yeah, offspring fitness that are, might be a bit more uh, yeah, secluded or that is not directly obvious when you think about tadpole transport behavior and fitness in offspring. And in recent years, many people got interested in the role of uh, amphibian or in skin microbiome in, in general. And for amphibians, we assume that this plays really a major role because amphibian skin is really so crucial and essential for their well being, as uh, yeah, this regulates so many processes. So, we were wondering whether this tadpole transport behavior actually is a mechanism to transfer skin microbiome from adults to offspring. So, we wanted to ask two questions. On one hand, is there is this a pathway to transmit uh, microbiota from offspring to parents? And also, is this uh, beneficial? So does the microbiome diversity increase after this settled transport behavior? And this work is conducted by a PhD student of mine, so Francesca Angelani, in collaboration with Dame Johnson and Dirk Schmeller and Adeline Luyo from, uh, uh, from Toulouse. And for that, we were conducting a quite complicated experiment in the last year. So we were um, waiting until males and females were uh, depositing a clutch in the tank, and then we, we removed the female, as yeah, in most of the cases, it's the male who's transporting. And then we created a condition where 
uh, males could basically transport their own tadpoles. And in a control, another control condition, we put a cage on top of the clutch to prevent the father to have direct contact with the with these with the tadpoles and the clutch. And we transferred the clutch after hatching to the provided water body. And in the test condition, we exchanged clutches so that the uh, yeah, the test individual, so the foster parent, was transporting tadpoles from a different breeding pair. And we uh, bred these in the, and raised these individual tadpoles until metamorphosis. And throughout this entire process, we took uh, yeah, incredible numbers of swaps from the environment, from skin of tadpoles, of adult frogs, different stages during larval development as well to um, collect microbiota uh, on, the, on the skin of those individuals. And we sent everything to, uh, to sequencing a couple of weeks ago. So right now we are in the middle of data analysis. So unfortunately, I can't uh, tell you about the results, but I hope that yeah, we will get the results pretty, pretty soon. And another project that is currently running where Francesca is also working in for her PhD is that we try to better understand reproductive ecology in neotropical glass frogs. So glass frogs are also an amazing frog family and they have their name derived from the fact that their ventral side is completely transparent. So you can really see the organs and in females, the eggs that are developing. And together with uh, this amazing team of PhDs, postdocs, and master student, uh, we went to, to the field in both Costa Rica and Ecuador to investigate patterns of space use and parental care and communication in these frogs. So uh, we were into the main questions that uh, we have is how does parenting affect space use? So is parental success or mating success um, linked to site fidelity and restricted movement? Uh, how much does this parental care really affect offspring development? So do males that show more parental care really enhance offspring development and hatching success in their offspring? And also uh, do females take these parental activities into account when mate, ma making their mating decisions? And uh, another question that uh, interests me for quite a long time is uh, associated with or identifying the costs and benefits of female multiple mating. So in a lot of actually amphibian species, uh, females mate multiple times with many males throughout the breeding season. And the key question, especially in the species with parental care is, does this come at a cost to the female because parental care per clutch then gets diluted per individual male, or is this actually at a cost to the male because he has more effort in caring for additional clutches? And uh, the first results from the master project uh, are already in. So Moritz in his master thesis identified the individuality of these glass frog calls and he found really stark differences in acoustic parameters in both spectral and temporal properties of these calls. So they allow for, would theoretically allow for individual discrimination. And he also found that frogs that call while simultaneously sitting on top of clutches, that the calls have very different properties than if frogs call while sitting next to a clutch or on the leaf without a clutch uh, nearby. So this uh, could theoretically be a signal to females that males uh, are active in parenting. And this could uh, then lead to really females evolving a preference for this type of call because this is directly linked to male uh, parental activity. But we are right now, again, still in the process of collecting this data, also running female choice experiments to really corroborate that the females care about these differences in the male calls. And yeah, to 
end my, my talk, I also want to very briefly mention that I'm not only interested in uh, reproductive behavior in amphibians, but I recently also started a gecko breeding lab together with my postdoc Birgit Sabo, where we raise uh, toki geckos to investigate the role of social structures, so basically family life on their on the cognitive development in the offspring. And to finalize my talk, I want to, um, I hope I could convince you that amphibian reproduction is not boring, is not monotonous, but is incredibly diverse. So we find enormous diversity of modes as well as mating and parental strategies. These frogs show crazy diversity in ecology and life history traits. And exactly this makes them ideal models to study the evolution of reproductive behavior, because we find this, this yeah, this, basically this great diversity allows us to really uh, identify the underlying traits that are important uh, to shape diverse reproductive strategies in different lineages. And finally, I want to acknowledge a lot of people that are yeah, very, very important for um, the success of this research program. So a lot of collaborators that helped along the way. Of course, this is only a very small list. Of course, all the students that participated in the field research, a lot of field assistants that uh, dedicate a lot of time and effort to help us collect the data in the field. A lot of logistic support, of course, in French Guiana, but now also in, in, in Costa Rica and Ecuador. And uh, thanks also to people at the animal care facilities in former times in Vienna and now here at the University of Bern. This is a really key um, uh, parameter that really uh, ensures the success of uh, a successful research is that the frogs are um, yeah, kept in, in, in good conditions. And finally, yeah, to all my funding uh, bodies that um, yeah, funded the field work and, uh, and the molecular work and the, yeah, the positions that were associated in all these, these projects. And finally, I'd like to thank all the people here at the Behavioral Ecology Division at the yeah, Ethological Research Station Hasli. I have an amazing team and we have really great discussions and uh, try to give each other very constructive feedback. And finally, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Eva, for this very passionate talk. So you showed us really interesting new results. Uh, I, I'm sure they have a couple of questions, but uh, I would uh, like to also persuade the audience, if they have any questions, that uh, they, can, uh, they can share it uh, in a row using the raising hand function in the reactions uh, button or reactions menu. Or you can also write your question in the chat and I will uh, read it to Eva. Uh, until you are talking about it and, and thinking about new questions, uh, I, I have some. Uh, yeah, the, the first is that uh, you, you mentioned uh, that probably there's a transmission of microbiome from uh, the adults to the tadpoles, but uh, it's, it's to my mind that uh, tadpoles are living under very uh, different conditions in an aquatic environment while uh, all the adult uh, poison frogs are terrestrial. So uh, do you have any information uh, about the, the changes in the microbiome uh, or, or nothing? You, you mentioned that uh, mm -hmm. your own results are under uh, yes. progress. This, and, and this was a, a quite spontaneous idea that we have a look at that and we are really at the total beginning of of that to understand i mean we also know that probably there is quite a big change from the field to conditions to our lab colony but we right now are mainly interested in the mechanism so i'm yeah not so worried about that the microbiome composition is a bit different than in frogs in the field but um yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I uh, probably uh, just add the, a little information about the importance of the microbiome and, and this uh, uh, skin defense line in, in frogs, because uh, in amphibians, you know that uh, their uh, skin is uh, 
uh, semi permeable, so there are many substances which can go through. And, and uh, actually, it's like a mucus layer, so it's like uh, uh, the inside of our mouth or of our guts or something like that. So it has a very uh, strong immune function uh, via this microbiome and also via some peptide components. So, so it's a very complex line of defense uh, in the skin of the frogs. Yeah, I mean, from also, we have many follow up questions, basically, also, if like a diverse microbiome then helps them, yeah, better grow and uh, complete metamorphosis. But yeah, I think this is, we, we just need to focus on, on one question at a time. And just want to, to see if we find anything, yeah, and also any differences between and adult individuals. Yeah. Uh... Until the others uh, probably uh, pose some questions, I still have some. So one is about uh, the location of the pools on your artificial island, because you've shown the slide that uh, I, I don't know if it's just a, a schematic illustration, yeah. but they were along the line. So yes. were they placed like this? Yes, this, this was on purpose <laughs> to facilitate any, yeah, on one hand, this was, yeah, from, from a logistic perspective also somehow necessary because we needed to put them at quite high elevation to make, because in the beginning we were also not sure how flooded will these islands get eventually. So we wanted to make sure that they are at quite high elevations on the island so that in case there is a temporal increase in water level due to heavy rains that not like all the pebbles inside those pools get washed away. Uh, this luckily was, was never the case, and we also wanted to have all spatial analysis easier. Yeah, and we already knew that we wanted to manipulate the location of those pools, and this is why we started in a straight line in the beginning. Yeah, uh, a consequence of this arrangement that uh, uh, probably it has a huge impact on the quality of each male's territory. Uh, am I right? Because some of them were uh, a little bit farther and another were closer to, to this uh, line of pools. Yeah, I mean, one could imagine that. I mean, we were also, I mean, one of the main questions also was to certain males that, let's say, are yeah, very proactive in this personality terminology, so that are um, more competitive against conspecifics if they occupy, so to say, the territories exactly around those pools, so to minimize the effort to, um, to transport, but we didn't find that. So it seems like uh, territory quality or attractiveness of a territory is linked to so many different parameters and probably more linked to the trees that supply the leaves for tadpole deposition and also the surrounding vegetation. So how much is the vegetation um, limiting the transmission of sound, for example? So in very dense habitats, also the territories, for example, are smaller because the sound doesn't propagate so, so quickly. So uh, probably also this, yeah, this microclimatic or micro vegetation scale is maybe more, much more important than if the pool is two or 300 meters away. Yeah, the uh, next thing uh, which came to my mind, uh, how could they feel the presence of the dragonfly larvae? So they, via sight or, or chemicals or what is the way for that? Probably both, but what we observe is that before tadpole deposition, they really sit on the edge of the pool and look into the water. <laughs> Maybe if they see some yeah, movements, some vibrations, and uh, yeah, I mean, I cannot completely exclude also chemicals, but definitely they look into the pools if there is something in there. And maybe they also use indirect cues to detect predators because in the pools where predators are inside, there are hardly any tadpoles. So probably high density of tadpoles is a sign of quality for the pool because this means low number of, of predators and 
high stability so that the pool can yeah, persist for a quite long time. So this is yeah, also very different to other poison frog species that have carnivores or cannibalistic tadpoles that really where the parents try to avoid pools where other tadpoles are already in there. It seems that in, in femoralis, which have herbi mainly herbivorous tadpoles, that it seems that high density of tadpoles is actually attractive to deposit also in there. That's oh, really interesting. Uh, that would be my next question, uh, how cannibalistic are the tadpoles, but it, it seems that they are absolutely not. So. No. Yeah. And, and I mean, competition is not a big problem in, in that case because uh, they get uh, enough algae inside these pools. It's, at least it seems so. Hmm. Yeah, uh, going back to the uh, first part of your talk, you, you mentioned uh, the plasticity of the mm -hmm. transportation behavior. Uh, and you didn't mention, but uh, there is another clade of uh, poison frogs in which this is the Ophaga genus, where mm -hmm. in, in every case the, the female is the, the only caring uh, sex. So uh, do you have any ideas how, how this uh, evolutionary change could have been evolved in this clade? I mean, I, I think that in general poison frogs, especially regarding tetral transport, I mean, Ovulation is, of course, restri is restricted to females, but I think that especially this type of transport behavior uh, probably was very flexible yeah, in the common ancestor and that it was uh, yeah, random, basically, whether the female or the male uh, conducted this behavior. And then probably some species rather evolved towards that the male stays with the clutches and the females benefit of like deserting the male and trying to remate again. And then in other taxa that really use these small phytotelmata where additional nutrition is required, then this is more or less got then fixed to the female because the female feed those tadpoles. Yeah, or, or another case is uh, the uh, long-term cooperation and pair yeah. bond like between the, the Ranitomeia, uh, some and, species of Ranitomeia genus. And, and the point is also that we have so little knowledge actually about what the frogs are doing in the wild. I mean, we have now over 300 species described, but if we think about how many species we actually have very detailed natural history information available is very limited because also for femoralis, this female tadpole transport behavior was known from previous anecdotal reports. So I found papers where people mentioned that they might have seen a female with tadpoles. And in many cases, they even say, yeah, maybe this was mistake and we did a mistake and this is actually a male. Or, uh, but there are no systematic observations why they do this or if this is really the case that they transport their own samples. And uh, I was just uh, a recent, uh, yeah, some years ago, I, I looked into this uh, behavioral ecology book from Kentwood Wells, where there is this huge table of uh, which poison frogs have which mating and parental strategies. And there are a couple of uh, species actually where they have this unclear situation where you have the male or the female as the predominant caregiver. And then in brackets, there's like, yeah, but maybe sometimes we also see the other sex doing it. So I think that there's much more flexibility going on and maybe a lot of crazy stuff that we right now have no idea about simply because yeah, that we, we don't know about what they're doing in the field. Yeah, as I recall my own uh, comparative studies, uh, and, and especially uh, this group of frogs, uh, uh, yeah, it's probably in, in the more ancient lineages of poison frogs, like in, in the Aromobatine uh, subfamily or, or family, depending on, on taxonomy, it's quite common that what is reported is a flexibility. Yeah. Uh, of the pairing uh, of, of the caring parents so sometimes it can be the male sometimes it can be the female so it is called amphisexual yes. uh, 
one sex is enough, but uh, it can change quite quickly in evolutionary terms. And uh, probably this ancient pattern canalized in some more derived plates into uh, male-only care or female-only care or, or cooperation between the male and the female. Yes. And I mean, I remember then when publishing this study, we also had long discussions about what is amphisexual behavior and what yep. is compensatory behavior. Yep. I, I see that, or at least I discussed that, that, that there's actually difference. So I see amphisexual behavior basically right at the point of OB position that there they somehow negotiate who stays there. So it's very similar to what we, we have in some bird species where they negotiate basically at the, the time at the nest who's staying there. Whereas what, what we observed in, 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 in Femoralis is, is rather compensatory behavior. So I would not call this amphisexual behavior because there was a predefined parent, which is the male, and only because he disappeared, the female then jumps in. I think this is a bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for this information. It's, I think it's very important, uh, both for comparative work and, and also for experimental behavioral studies to, to have very clear definitions about these terms and, and to use them correctly. Oh, I see no other questions. So this is the last chance because soon our time is running out. But if there is none, then thanks again for your interesting talk. And I hope we can uh, continue this discussion sometime in, in person, yeah, somewhere absolutely. in your institute or our institute. It, it was organizing a, a personal visit. Hopefully we are over the COVID restrictions. Soon, yeah. Now we started to, to have in-person seminars again. Yeah. yeah, 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 sure. Okay, thanks again. Okay, and thanks for the nice audience. Yeah, it was very nice. Uh, hopefully we will see you again somewhere in the future. So thanks for you all. Bye. Okay, bye.